August 7, 1990. President Bush, responding to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, orders American forces to deploy to Saudi Arabia. U.S. Central Command Air Forces, or U.S. CENTAF, had to move its forces 7,000 miles quickly. Within days, five U.S. Air Force squadrons and two U.S. carriers arrived in the Gulf. So we brought over those kinds of airplanes you need to defend and deter, such as air defense aircraft, AWACS, F-16s, and A-10s to ground attack missions, and also the F-15E to provide us capability at night. In just five weeks, the Coalition Air Force outnumbered the Iraqi Air Force. We then fleshed the force out with more aircraft, uh, primarily aircraft such as B-52s, uh, more A-10s, more F-16s, the coalition would eventually have close to 3,000 planes. These fighter and attack planes patrolled the desert, providing cover for the largest military airlift in history. Airlift, the hidden part of air power. It was the fastest way to get enough men and material over to defend the desert kingdom. Military and civilian cargo planes delivered 91,000 troops and 72,000 tons of cargo in the month of August alone to places like Riyadh, Jubail, Dharan. Dharan in the early going to his wall-to-wall -wall planes. Uh, literally, planes would be holding until a plane took off so another plane could land. In November and December, after the president decided we needed more forces on, we actually went into a second peak. We went through the same thing, hauling maximum use of strategic forces to bring things into the theater. The Desert Storm Air Campaign would have four phases. Phase one had three goals. Gain air superiority, destroy Saddam's strategic capability, namely his NBC weapons and long-range missiles nicknamed Scuds, and disrupt his command and control. The Allies estimated the first phase would last 20 to 25 days. Phase two would be short. The Allies planned on taking one day to suppress mobile air defenses in the KTO, or Kuwaiti Theater of Operations. During phase three, Allied air power would continue to hit the targets of phase one, but they would shift their attack to the Iraqi field army in the KTO, totaling close to a half million men, over 4,000 tanks. An important target would be Saddam's crack troops the Republican Guard. Although they numbered less than 3% of the coalition fighters, the F-117 struck almost a third of the targets on the first day. These stealth fighters led the attack, penetrating the Iraqi IADs unseen. The first actual uh, bomb to fall on Iraq, that occurred at about nine minutes uh, before what we referred to as H-hour. An F-117 took out the southern IOC that controlled the reporting sites. Stealth fighters then penetrated the heavy air defenses around Baghdad. So we flew 32 F-117s uh, right into downtown Baghdad in the, in the first hour and 20 minutes. The F-15Es went after all of the permanent Scud launchers uh, out in western Iraq and the storage areas associated with that. The uh, F-111s during the same time period, uh, in addition to the TLAMs, took out some of the power grids and hit many of the industrial sites and the airfield. The uh, GR-1s from the RAF also were very heavy in striking the airfields, as were the B-52s in striking the southern airfields. The F-14s and the uh, F-15Cs in air-to-air -air mode were there from the start that evening, making sure that the uh, tankers and the AWACS airplanes were protected. The Iraqis never recovered from the Allies' first punch on that first night. So we seized control of the air in the initial moments of the air campaign and as a result, made all the rest of it much easier, much more efficient and possible. I think that the one thing that this war has done from an air power standpoint, without a doubt, that it has changed uh, mass to precision. Uh, where we dropped 30,000 bombs to uh, take out a target in World War II and 300 bombs in Vietnam, we dropped one in Iraq. Precision-guided munitions are conventional bombs fitted with laser or electro-optical guidance systems. Only 7% of the tonnage dropped on Iraq and Kuwait was precision tonnage. But some estimate that these bombs destroyed 80% of the strategic targets during the war. With the combination of stealth 
and precision attack capability in the 117, we were able to attack targets very discreetly. With precision munitions, the coalition could avoid civilian areas and hit leadership targets instead. We went after their Minister of Defense uh, facilities, uh, we went after the security uh, facilities, we went after the Bath Party headquarters facilities. Those were the areas where the most barbaric acts and decisions uh, supporting those were made and executed and controlled from. It was uh, critical to be able to take that element out of that society. And it's also critical to let the populace see that that segment of their society was as vulnerable as anyone else. The Allies used precision weapons to take down Iraqi bridges, cutting off the army in Kuwait from reinforcements and supplies. On day four or five, I put 11 F-117s and four F-111s uh, dropping precision bombs. And uh, we put seven bridges in the water the first night. Other aircraft trolled for convoys. The resupply of the Iraqi army slowed from 20,000 tons a day to 2,000 tons. From the start of the war, B-52s hammered airfields and large strategic targets such as power plants, petroleum supplies, and military centers. But their most important mission hit the Republican Guard. Very early on into the campaign, we were providing three B-52s every hour and a half over a Republican Guard target or a target that had to do with softening up the Kuwaiti theater of operation. The B-52 struck regardless what kind of weather that there was over the target area. Secondly, we struck all day and all night without warning, without their ability to effectively mass a counter air offensive against the B-52s. And as such, it was very, very effective putting firepower on their equipment, their troop locations, their artillery, their tanks, and they could do nothing about it. And it was extremely demoralizing. As is vividly described by one of the POWs, said the airplane that they feared most on the front lines were the A-10s, because their accuracy, using the POW's words, they never missed. And when they're overhead orbiting, and you're in a, a tank or in with a group in a revetment, you didn't know if you were being picked out. So it was a very unnerving situation to experience and had a tremendous psychological impact. Despite Saddam's fortifications all around Kuwait, his flank in Iraq was weak and exposed. General Schwarzkopf wanted to exploit it. He had airlifters position thousands of troops and equipment for a massive Allied thrust through Iraq. One of our biggest jobs that we had over here was to move major elements of the 18th Airborne Corps starting on uh, the day after the bombing started. For the first 14 days, we had a 1.30 scheduled into Rafa every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day. That ability to move that vast amount of people and a lot of their vehicles that quickly, uh, in my mind, Saddam Hussein never caught on until much later on in the ground war that there was anybody even up there. B-52s and the F-117s teamed up to hit Iraqi breach lines as the ground troops made their final preparations. We put massive B-52 strikes in to bomb through those areas so that there would be clear paths that went through the breach areas so that when the troops went through there would be a pathway cleared. It was time for the ground troops to liberate Kuwait. General Schwarzkopf launched the ground war on February 24, 1991, 39 days from the start of the air campaign. The original Allied plan was only nine days off schedule. Negative radar contact. Such as that, we're garlic one three. Allied air power entered phase four, providing close air support. It's very difficult in a very fast paced ground campaign such as this war featured for the Army to know when and where they're going to need close air support. So we created a system called push cast. And what we did is we pushed sorties forward over the battlefield every minute of the hour, and we were able then to divert those sorties to where the Army needed them for emergency situations during close air support, or if there was no need from the Army, we would then send them on to do an interdiction target uh, beyond the fire support coordination line. There's a CDU hit. 
the Iraqis were routed. They surrendered by the tens of thousands. One of the captured division commanders, when asked, how come you didn't use your artillery? And he replied, my artillery was destroyed by air 100% before the ground campaign started. And in fact, I called for artillery support from the division next to mine, and their artillery was destroyed 100% by air in transit to support my division. I will tell you my private conviction is that this is the first time in history that a field army has been defeated by air power.